In February 1945, the Axis alliance looks certain to lose this war. It is just a question of time. Even the Axis powers themselves know that, but two things stand in the way of an immediate end. One, the United Nations Alliance has to agree amongst themselves what the final goals they want to achieve are, and two, the Axis, well, Germany and Japan, have to accept defeat and capitulate. But as the Allies prepare to meet at Yalta, those goals are, to some extent, irreconcilable. And anyhow, neither Germany nor Japan are anywhere close to giving up. Let's look at this more closely. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is a very long World War II in real time special episode on the diplomatic and military goals of the Allies and Axis powers here in early 1945. In Europe, the Third Reich is squeezed on both sides in a giant pincer movement. In Berlin, Hitler resolves to go down with the ship, while some of the others begin looking for an exit. Meanwhile, the big three allies grapple with the problems of territorial settlement in Europe, the question of the Polish government, and policy towards Germany. This is all as they build up to the Yalta Conference. In the Far East, any chance for a coalition between the Chinese nationalists and communists is gone. In Tokyo, the Japanese prepare for the final decisive battle, which they don't think they'll win, but which they believe will allow them to exit the war honorably. But let's start with Europe. Okay, so the three men at the top of the Allied coalition in Europe, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, disagree on about as much as they agree on. That is not surprising, really, as the men could hardly be more different. This fight has brought together a Victorian imperialist, a social crusader, and a Soviet tyrant. But despite all the arguing in public, and private, the three men fight this war on a level of intrastate coordination never before seen, so their policies and goals are impossible to talk about in isolation. So we'll run through some of the key themes and challenges that the Allied leadership is working on. Right. So the first is the territorial settlement in Europe. Britain and the Soviet Union have sort of come to something of an understanding over most of Eastern and Southern Europe. Both Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin view the situation through much more of an imperialist realist lens than their American counterpart, President Roosevelt. Since last summer, Churchill has been keen to set out the boundaries of the post-war world, especially where British and Soviet interests rub up against each other in the Balkans. On the evening of October 9th, 1944, at the Moscow Conference, Churchill scribbled what he called the naughty document on a sheet of paper and handed it to Stalin. This divided up much of Eastern Europe and the Balkans into spheres of influence. The terms set out on the evening of October 9th, 1944 were as follows. The Soviets would have 75% influence in Bulgaria, 90% in Romania. The West would have 90% in Greece. Yugoslavia and Hungary would be split 50-50. Those Percentages were changed, though, after a day or so of further discussion between British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden and Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. Hungary was amended to 80% in favor of the Soviets. See, in countries like Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, Churchill was willing to give away a great deal of influence if Britain could retain a 90% stake in Greece. By doing that, Britain can remain a Mediterranean power after the war and secure the Suez Canal and the links to the empire in the east. We saw the beginnings of Churchill's free hand in Greece when Stalin sat back and allowed the British to deal with the December mess there that we followed in both of our episodes. I, it didn't go well, and Churchill's heavy-handed actions there have increased anti-British sentiment, which may have repercussions down the line. Which may. But what does Franklin Roosevelt think of the percentages deal? This sort of underhand determination of millions of people's lives should stand against his classic liberal principles. Well, FDR was unable to attend the Moscow conference as he was preparing for the American November presidential election. And although he sent ambassador to the Soviet Union, Avril Harriman, to the conference, Churchill and Stalin excluded Harriman from the discussions on the percentages agreement. 
Churchill also told Stalin that in public, it would be better to express these things in diplomatic terms, mm -hmm. rather than using the phrase dividing into spheres, for that sort of language was only likely to shock the Americans. But when Roosevelt does learn about the percentages agreement, he expressed something of a realist view towards it. He responded to telegrams from Churchill and Stalin on October 12th with the following bland message. I am most pleased to know that you are reaching a meeting of your two minds as to international policies in which, because of our present and future common efforts to prevent international wars, we are still interested. But behind the diplomatic niceties, this sort of 19th century diplomacy only strengthened FDR's determination to arrange another Allied summit. In the months leading up to Yalta, the president received competing advice from his State Department on how to deal with the issue. On November 8th, a memo from Under Secretary of State Edward Statinius framed the problem in classically liberal terms and argued that the U.S. should support neither of its allies in the Balkans, but should assert its own independent interests in favor of equitable arrangements designed to attain general peace and security on the basis of good neighborship. Essentially saying American policy should support the Wilsonian principles of self-determination, free markets, and things like freedoms of the press and association. On the other side of the spectrum, George Kennan argues on the eve of the Yalta summit that American policy has been too muddled towards the Soviet Union. He says the Soviets will try to find their reward for winning the war at the expense of people in Eastern and Central Europe. Despite this, the Americans have so far refused to set serious limits on Soviet expansion, and Kennan believes that Moscow's fears that Washington is laying a trap. To restore what he calls a dignified and stable foundation to Europe, something like the Churchill-Stalin agreement is the best that could be hoped for. He writes, Why could we not make a decent and definite compromise with it? Divide Europe, frankly, into spheres of influence. Keep ourselves out of the Russian sphere and keep the Russians out of ours. That would have been the most honest thing we could do for ourselves and our friends in Europe. Whatever Roosevelt's thoughts are, it appears that he's let the issue go, at least for now. He doesn't bring up the percentages at Yalta. The question of Poland was mentioned only briefly in Moscow between Churchill and Stalin before they produced the naughty document. In part, that's because Churchill considered the matter settled. He was happy, or at least resigned, to accept the Soviet demand that Poland's eastern border be redrawn along the Curzon line. This would give the Soviet Union a big chunk of pre-war Polish eastern territory, including cities like Vilno, Brest, and Lwów. The Poles would then be compensated on their western side with territory taken from Germany. Churchill hoped that this would allow the formation of a 50-50 power-sharing deal between the London-based Polish government in exile and the Moscow-backed Polish Committee of National Liberation, the PCNL. But while the settlement is acceptable to Churchill and Stalin, the London Poles find it completely unacceptable. Churchill asked Polish Prime Minister in exile Stanisław Mikołajczyk to Moscow with the aim of a settlement. He arrived on October 12th, and over the next couple days, the London Poles held a series of tense meetings with Churchill, Stalin, and the Moscow Poles. Both Stalin and Molotov indicated that acceptance of the Curzon Line as eastern border would make the deal possible. Churchill got increasingly frustrated as he tried to get Mikowajczyk's agreement. The British Prime Minister tried a variety of euphemisms like demarcation line or basis of a frontier instead of the word border, but Mikowajczyk was having none of it. The London Poles refused to give up any Polish territory, even though Churchill pointed out that much of that land is populated by Ukrainians and is already occupied by the Red Army anyhow. On October 14th, Churchill exploded at Mikowajczyk. Because of quarrels between Poles, we are not going to wreck the peace of Europe. Unless you accept the frontier, you are out of business forever. The Russians will sweep through your country and your people will be liquidated. You are on the verge of annihilation. Some of Churchill's fury is a theatrical tactic, some. But the reality is that he is simultaneously angry with and sympathetic for the London Poles. He certainly respects what he sees as their naive stubbornness, even though this allows the Moscow Poles to outmaneuver them. Later, he tells the king, 
Our lot from London are a decent but feeble lot of fools, but the delegates from Lublin seem to be the greatest villains imaginable. Mikowajcik had a final meeting alone with Stalin October 18th. Stalin again assured Mikowajcik that he had no plans to Sovietize Poland and that the Poles would be compensated with German land in the West. But then Stalin demanded recognition of the Curzon Line and Mikowajcik refused. Unless you believe the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which reported of the meeting that... At the end of negotiations, Mikowajcik said that he personally agreed on recognizing the Kherson line as the Soviet-Polish border, but that he must discuss the matter with his colleagues in London. He intended to return very quickly. Churchill, Mikowajcik, and the rest of the British and Polish delegation leave Moscow the next day. Churchill thinks that the conference has gone well. He's got what he wants on Greece. Churchill doesn't really trust Stalin, but there is certainly a warmth between the two men. Both enjoyed late evening discussions, which became long, boozy nights of banter. For his part, Stalin never really had a huge interest in Greece, and he was happy to give it up in return for Soviet domination of Romania and Bulgaria. On Poland, it doesn't matter much to him whether the London Poles agree to anything. Stalin has the troops on the ground, and in the end, that's what matters. In the end, Mikowajcik resigns on November 24th after failing to persuade his cabinet to accept the Curzon line. He's replaced by Tomasz Artsychewski, who rejects any loss of territory in the east. Stalin presses forward with his plans to recognize the Moscow Poles as the official Polish government. Churchill speaks out against this in the House of Commons on December 15th, and the next day, Roosevelt sends a message urging Stalin to postpone this until Yalta. But, unsurprisingly, Stalin doesn't wait around. On December 27th, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet announces that it intends to recognize the PCNL as the new government of Poland. Churchill and Roosevelt are both adamant that they will not recognize the Moscow-backed Poles as the legitimate government of Poland. Roosevelt sends another letter to Stalin on December 30th, again urging postponement until the next conference. Churchill wants to wait until he and Roosevelt can put up a joint argument against Stalin. It looks like the stage is set for a big disagreement between East and West. To sum things up, very much oversimplified, Stalin is looking to secure Soviet hegemony based on communist rule over the eastern parts of Europe closest to the USSR, while Churchill wants a British zone of influence to counter that in Western and Southeast Europe. Although both he and Roosevelt are actually opposed to Stalin's goals, Roosevelt doesn't want to get his hands dirty in a fight about it. But what about France in all of this? Aha. Uh -huh. See, the Polish question also links to the French question in a roundabout sort of way. Since the liberation of Paris, Charles de Gaulle has set himself the task of wiping away the stain of 1940 and re-establishing France as a great power. Now, the relationship between de Gaulle and Churchill has had its ups and downs over the past four and a half years. Uh, I mean, definitely more downs than ups recently. We covered a lot of that in our 24-hour D-Day series. But still, the two men respect each other, and de Gaulle invites Churchill and Eden to Paris on November 10th. The visit eases some of the tensions between the two. De Gaulle lobbies Churchill for a share in the Allied occupation of Germany and for attendance at the next conference of the Big Three. Churchill relays this to Stalin and Roosevelt in his correspondence. Stalin has no objection to French attendance, but Roosevelt is thoroughly opposed. By this point, he despises de Gaulle. De Gaulle believes that building bridges with Moscow will allow him to follow a more independent foreign policy. He also wants Soviet support in securing French territorial claims in the German Rhineland. And by November, anyhow, Stalin is keen to invite de Gaulle to the USSR. The reason? He is receiving reports that Britain wants to build a Western bloc on the continent centered around France. Which, as you said earlier, is not altogether wrong. But what this Western bloc would even look like is a bit unclear. Is it to defend against a resurgent Germany or against the Soviet Union? Is France to be fully rearmed? Are there to be a series of bilateral treaties or a supranational security organization? Well, just in case it is, 
the Soviet Union that is targeted, Stalin feels that a Franco-Soviet alliance would seriously undermine such a prospect. He also sees the opportunity to gain de Gaulle's approval for his Polish government. On December 10th, de Gaulle's and Stalin's meeting ends with the signing of a Treaty of Alliance and Mutual Assistance. It doesn't create an ideological alliance and has gone some way to his rebuilding the French as an independent global actor, but de Gaulle gets far less out of the meeting than Stalin. It looks like Stalin has managed to peel France away from the other Western powers. He now has a treaty with Paris, whereas London and Washington do not. In return, though, he has given de Gaulle no real support on the Rhineland, instead deferring this until the next Big Three conference, a conference that de Gaulle will not, in fact, be attending. Also, the French agree to exchange diplomatic representatives with the Moscow-backed government in Poland. The question of the future of Germany will also be on the agenda of Yalta. Back at the second Quebec conference in September, American Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau proposed the Morgenthau Plan, which stipulated splitting Germany into two countries and neutralizing its industrial capacity. At first, Churchill was enraged by this, calling it unnatural, unchristian, and unnecessary. But the Americans made it clear that further Lend-Lease aid was conditional on Britain's acceptance, so Churchill endorsed the plan on September 15th, despite the furious opposition of Anthony Eden. Churchill summarized the plan in his own words. This program for eliminating the war-making industries in the Ruhr and the Saar is looking forward to converting Germany into a country primarily agricultural and pastoral. But by now, the plan has been dropped. The public reaction in the West was almost entirely negative. It also handed Germany a new source of propaganda. Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels declared that the plan proposed by that Jew Morgenthau would rob 80 million Germans of their industry and turn Germany into a simple potato field. Still, Churchill reiterated to Stalin in Moscow that he was in favor of harsh terms towards Germany. Both concluded that a long occupation would be necessary to prevent another rise of German militarism. Despite having opposing goals for Europe in general regarding occupation and demilitarization, the big three are in agreement. One other area they are not seeing eye to eye on, though, is colonialism. For sure. Both Britain and France and the Dutch are concerned about keeping hold of their colonial empires. Charles de Gaulle is determined to re-establish control over regions like Indochina and countries in North Africa which were occupied by the Axis and now play host to British and American troops and bases. The Dutch want to keep the Dutch East Indies and in Britain. Angst at the prospect of Indian independence is very real. Churchill knows that Roosevelt will not support an attempt to hold on to the subcontinent. In fact, the American president makes a point that ending colonialism should be a goal of the war. Speaking of Asia, we should mention China here too. The Americans tried to bring two of the three rival governments together in November 1944 when the American ambassador to China, Patrick Hurley, went to see the communists in Yan'an. He negotiates Mao Zedong's agreement to a five-point plan to create some sort of government together with the Chinese nationalists. However, he did this without the support or even the knowledge of nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek. And when Hurley returns to Chongqing, Chiang thoroughly rejects the proposal. He refuses to compromise on his demand that communist troops must be placed directly under nationalist command and that there is no place for the communists in any new government. Chiang's forces are in a pretty rough state, though. In December, the Japanese Ishigo offensive reached its furthest point of advance, and it did sabotage the nationalist war effort. Though, to be fair, it sort of does that to the overextended Japanese as well. But Chang's forces took somewhere between half a million and 750,000 total casualties. By now, though, Mao's forces have close to two million regular troops and militia. Mao is really trying to decide how to play things. With the nationalists exhausted, there is the potential for taking the reins of power. But with the war against Japan expected to go on for another one or two years, he has to be careful not to lose the moral high ground. In the end, he advocates a policy of cautious expansionism, filling the vacuum in areas where the nationalists have retreated, but being careful not to 
to expand beyond his means. The fragmentation of China looks like it might further deepen. There is also still the Nanjing collaborationist regime to deal with. And hey, in return for entering the war against Japan once Germany has been taken care of, Stalin wants military and transport concessions in Manchuria and control over outer Mongolia. Oh, okay, okay, so this is the Allies, right? But what about the Axis? With their backs to the walls, surely, surely now is the time to come to their senses and try to find a way out of this crazy war. Well, let's start in Europe and look at what's going on in the rapidly shrinking remains of the Third Reich. Pretty much as soon as the Wehrmacht failed to throw the Western Allies back into the sea, Hitler accepted that this war on two fronts could not be won. But that didn't necessarily mean that he accepted that Germany would lose either. Drawing on his fascination with history, Hitler imagines himself as a modern-day Frederick the Great, the 18th century Prussian king. In 1761, Frederick was facing seemingly certain defeat in the war against Austria and Russia. He'd taken huge losses. Russian troops were threatening Berlin, and he'd run out of money. But at the darkest moment, in January 1762, the Russian Tsarina Elizabeth died. Within weeks, her nephew, Peter III, signed a separate peace with Prussia, and Frederick ended up with more territory than before. I mean, it's a long shot in 1945, but it's not totally unthinkable, is it? No, certainly not. We've discussed some of the many differences that exist between Churchill and FDR on one side and Stalin on the other, but there are many even between the two Western leaders. Right. And Hitler wanted to engineer a breakup between them with the Ardennes Offensive back in December. He thought that a shattering blow would split the Allies in the field, cut off British Second Army so it could be destroyed, and force the Western Allies to conclude a separate peace deal. This would then allow the Germans to send force from the Western Front to the East to hold back the Red Tide, and also give more time for the further development of super weapons to then defeat the Red Tide, the Soviets. The trouble was, the whole plan had little to almost no chance of success. Indeed, but even after its failure, and Hitler loses any military ability to split the Allied coalition, he still holds on to the conviction that the coalition will naturally crumble eventually anyhow. So Hitler's plan is basically to hold out for as long as possible and hope that fate rescues him. He does not have much in the way of a plan B. You are correct. Mm -hmm. The only alternative to the breakup of the Allied coalition is quite simple. Defeat for Germany and death for all the leading Nazis. But within his own perverse worldview, Hitler feels strengthened by accepting this final binary set of options. During one of his conversations with Josef Goebbels at the beginning of February, Hitler apparently says, The best thing to do is to burn one's bridges, not only professionally, but also personally. The person who no longer cares whether or not he lives is usually the one who wins in the end. This is all happening against the backdrop of the enormous Soviet successes in the East in January and February 1945. The Eastern Front is crumbling. Hundreds of thousands of Hitler's men are dying or falling prisoner. Hundreds of thousands of citizens of the Reich are being raped and murdered. But paradoxically, these defeats give Hitler a strange sort of hope that his prediction of an Allied split will now come true. With Stalin moving ever further west, Hitler tells Goebbels that Churchill is itching to jump ship from the Allied coalition and join the Germans in order to prevent the Bolshevizing of Europe. Okay, Churchill does hate communism, but there's no prospect of him jumping ship and turning against Stalin, at least while this war is still going. Right, and it's not like Hitler is open to making any sort of appeal to the British. In January and February, Goebbels tries to persuade Hitler to make some sort of foreign policy effort. Joachim von Ribbentrop and Robert Ley both make similar appeals, but Hitler refuses to extend any sort of offer until somehow he can secure more favorable negotiating conditions. Goebbels is probably at the moment, the most clear-sighted of all the Nazi bigwigs. In early February, he tells his wife, Yes, sweetheart, we've had it. Bled white. Finished. There's nothing to be done. 
And while the details will only be settled at Yalta, the United Nations allies are firm in continued demands for unconditional surrender. Without a negotiated settlement from strength or the breakup of the Allies, there are only two options left for Hitler. The first is a 1918-style collapse and armistice. Hitler makes it clear that this will not happen. There can be no question of a capitulation. History does not repeat itself. The other alternative is self-destruction. After the failure of that last final idea for peace, both Hitler and Goebbels are resigned to their deaths. For Hitler, a fight to the end, and then death by one's own hand is infinitely preferable to capture or a bullet from the Red Army. Goebbels has reached the same conclusion. At the end of February, he makes a broadcast to the nation and announces that if the enemy is victorious, life would not be worth living for him or his family. Alongside his own self-destruction, Hitler has already begun ordering the destruction of the German nation. Already, he has been ordering the demolition or paralyzing of industrial installations rather than allowing them to fall into the hands of the enemy. This wanton destruction is opposed by one man within Hitler's inner circle, Albert Speer, Hitler's chief slave driver. With his first-hand knowledge of the German war industry, and the sudden loss of vital industrial materials and resources in Silesia and Hungary, Speer concludes that defeat is only months away. On January 30th, Speer submits a memorandum to Hitler outlining the dire consequences of losing the coal-producing region of Upper Silesia to the Red Army. At the current levels of coal and steel capacity, Speer writes that it will be impossible to sustain the German economy. Collapse will come in a matter of months. In bold letters, he types. The material superiority of the enemy can accordingly no longer be countered by the bravery of our soldiers. Hitler basically just chooses to ignore this. He's dead set on his path. Fight to the death and destroy the nation as you go. Speer's main priority now is to try to convince Hitler to halt the demolition. There are two interconnected reasons why Speer wants this. The first is that the German industrial leaders who form much of his power base, want their factories to be up and running again after the war. The second is that Speer wants to be able to present himself to the Allies as a rational actor who prevented Hitler's wanton destruction. He hopes for a senior position in post-Hitler Germany. Like Hitler and Goebbels, he doesn't believe that the war can be won, but he still doesn't believe that it is entirely lost, continuing to believe that some sort of accommodation with the West is possible, and that this requires mobilizing every possible aspect and facet of German society to hold out as long as possible. Yeah, okay. Um, what about Heinrich Himmler? Well, for now, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler remains outwardly loyal. When the Allies began overrunning occupied territory in both East and West, his security forces have been cracking down harder than ever on the German population. In towns on the Western Front, raising a white flag to Allied forces is punishable by summary execution. In return, Hitler has granted Himmler ever more power over the German state and military. Yeah, I've covered a bunch of that recently in my weekly regular episodes, as well as Reichsführer SS, Chief of the German Police, Minister of the Interior, and Commander of the Replacement Army, Himmler is now also the military commander of the Volkssturm and the commander of Army Group Vistula. Publicly, Himmler gives no hint of any doubts in the final victory, nor does he in his private letters to fellow SS officers. To them, he promises that life will go on as normal after Germany's victory. But in reality, the Reichsführer is playing a dangerous double game and will soon begin looking to the West to save his own skin. On February 19th, SS Brigade Führer and leader of the Foreign Intelligence Service, Walter Schellenberg, arranges a meeting between Himmler and Count Volker Bernadotte, a member of the Swedish royal family and vice president of the Swedish Red Cross. See, Bernadotte was sent to Berlin by the Swedish government to explore the possibilities of the release of concentration camp prisoners, particularly those from Scandinavia. Himmler clearly wants to make a good impression to show himself as someone the West can do business with. Bernadotte will later write of Himmler at the meeting. He appeared strikingly, indeed astoundingly obliging, showed his sense of humor, even a touch of gallows humor, a number of times and liked to make a joke to lighten the tone a little. Himmler continues to believe that the war is a war against Judaism, and now he hopes that he can use the few Jewish people who remain alive in his camps as 
pawns to negotiate a more favorable end to the war. There's quite a few SS men trying to reach out to allied intelligence through neutral powers. Astrid will be covering some of that in upcoming Spies and Ties episodes later on in the winter stuff. Right, Astrid? Yes! Yes. I'm doing it. For now, none of that has any official sanction, and although Himmler knows, he has not gotten heavily involved. We'll see how that develops. So, the SS, the men whose honor is supposed to be loyalty, well, are looking for the exit. Perhaps, but essentially the Nazi leadership has, on the whole, resolved to fight to the bitter end, even including the self-destruction of themselves and their country. And even those like Speer and Himmler, who have begun looking at alternative end scenarios, remain loyal to Hitler and the Nazi cause. At least for now. Okay, so that's Berlin. What about the other side of the world in Tokyo? Well, right now, the government, the military, and the people are preparing for the final decisive battle. A battle larger than anything before to be fought on the Japanese home island. A battle that will be so damaging to the Allied invaders that they will be forced to make a peace agreement. The fear of that scenario being the only way an end will happen has given the Americans a sense of some urgency in getting the Soviets to actively join the war against Japan. It will very much be on Roosevelt's agenda when he speaks to Stalin at Yalta. To understand how we got here, with the Japanese government planning for this showdown and rejecting any thoughts of ending the war, you have to go back a couple of years. At the end of September 1943, Imperial General Headquarters defined the Absolute National Defense Zone, a defensive perimeter at which Japanese forces were to be fortified, replenished, and marshaled for a decisive battle. Holding the defense zone was considered absolutely essential for securing the empire. But by the summer of 1944, the Allies had already breached the defense zone. In June, the capture of Hollandia in New Guinea gave them a staging point for further offensives towards the Dutch East Indies and the Philippines. In the Central Pacific, the Allies bypassed and isolated the Japanese naval base at Truk, and then they hit the Marianas. Taking Saipan and Tinian in early July gave them air bases less than 2,500 kilometers from the Japanese home islands within B-29 bomber range. Then the Japanese lost the Battle of the Philippine Sea, giving the Allies aerial and naval supremacy in the Western Pacific. This worsened the impact of the Allied naval blockade, and then transport losses of fuel, raw materials, and food grew very serious. The Philippines took on a new importance at that point. An Imperial General Headquarters analysis identified the islands as the next major target for the Allies, a possible stepping stone towards invasion of the home islands, so top priority was given to reinforcing them. They also decided that not only should the Philippines be the place to stop the Allies, but it would be the decisive battle, the final battle that would break the Americans, or would at least demonstrate that the cost of actually invading Japan would be too high and would bring the Allies to the negotiating table. Then Japan could secure a favorable peace agreement, keep as many of its new colonies as possible, and still reign supreme over the Asia-Pacific region. This isn't really an entirely new strategy. The Japanese pretty much always knew that the war would have to end in some form of negotiated settlement. The whole idea of Pearl Harbor was to give the Japanese forces time to run wild and take an empire and then show that taking it back would cost too much in American money, lives, and time so the Allies would negotiate with. The idea, though, for a decisive battle was formalized as the Shogo Operation. Orders issued by the Army Section of Imperial General Headquarters on July 24, 1944, laid out the plan. The Japanese would build more airfields in the Philippines and send troops from Shanghai to Luzon. By early September, the Army and Navy Air Services had agreed on joint orders for their pilots. They should wait until the invading forces were as close as possible before the full weight of our air forces is thrown into the attack. They ordered the Shogo plan into action when the Americans attacked in October. It did not work out for them. Yeah, the Allies won big at Leyte Gulf, then landed on Leyte, then landed on Luzon last month. Now they are advancing on Manila. No final decisive battle has been really fought that defeated the Allies, though Leyte Gulf was the biggest naval battle of the war and wrecked the Japanese Navy. So maybe 
Maybe it's time to negotiate. <laughs> of course not. The only option is another really final, final decisive, decisive battle. battle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> IGH sent out a directive on January 20th approved by the Emperor, which will become the basis for all future homeland defense planning. It's a long document, but there's one sentence which sums it up. The final decisive battle of the war will be waged in Japan proper. Preparations for the final battle go into motion immediately. Japan is to construct, through January and February, a national defense sphere delineated by the Bonin Islands, Formosa, the coastal sector of eastern China, and southern Korea. The Japanese launch a huge program of reinforcements of the home islands. On New Year's Day 1945, there were only 12 field divisions in all of Japan proper, so four divisions two armored and two infantry come over from Manchuria. This month, orders are sent out for a three-phase mobilization program to build an enormous home island defense force suited for repelling en masse an allied invasion of the home islands. Hey, if you watched our D-Day series, you might remember those static divisions the Germans had on the coast of Normandy, right? They had little in the way of transport and were pretty much just expected to fight and die as coastal defenses. Well, the Japanese want to set up 22 of those. They also want to establish 15 counterattack divisions, which are to move rapidly from inland positions to strike the enemy beachheads. There are also 15 mixed brigades and six tank brigades, including logistical and administrative infrastructure. This mobilization is expected to add 1.5 million men. That would mean a force of almost 3 million for defense of the home islands. All of this is going to take a lot of time, though. So Japanese command decides that something must be sacrificed to gain time. Something looks right now like it's going to be the island of Okinawa, home to nearly half a million people. But they don't really consider it part of Japan proper, and the native Okinawans, and those of mixed ethnicity, are second-class citizens. Okinawans are to be drafted into an ad hoc local defense corps. More than 20,000 men between the ages of 17 and 45 will be assigned to build airfields and transport materials. 1,800 male students mobilized into a fighting corps and female students trained as nurses. But okay, that's the general Japanese military picture in February 1945. But what about the political situation? Why is Japan so determined to fight a decisive battle? Why is no one putting a stop to this? By this point, Japan's war is being directed by the six men of the Supreme Council for the direction of the war, the Saiko Senso Shiro Kai. This is a sort of inner cabinet composed of the prime minister, the foreign minister, the army and navy ministers, and the chiefs of staff of each service. Prime Minister Kuniaki Koizo created the council last year in an attempt to harmonize the political and military strategies. But the army and navy still have a lot of control. Importantly, the army and navy ministers in the cabinet must be serving military men, not civilians. This completely ties their loyalties to the military and the military objectives. Either service can also dissolve a cabinet at any time by simply withdrawing its minister. And the military also controls the feed of information to the civilians in the government and uses this to head off criticism or dissent. We saw this after the Battle of Midway when the Navy seriously obscured the true scale of its losses. For his part, Koizo certainly has his doubts about Japan's prospects in this war, but by now he has firmly wedded himself to the opinion that negotiations can only be carried out after a decisive victory. Hence his efforts to mobilize 100 million Japanese for the final battle. Beyond the Supreme Council for the direction of the war, there are really only two other men who have much say over Japan's course in the war. Those are Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, Kuichi Kido, and Emperor Hirohito. Hirohito does seem to have his doubts about Japan's prospects. He instructs Kido to arrange an audience with the Council of Former Prime Ministers, the Yushin, on February 7th. At least one member of Yushin is very keen on the idea of peace. Prince Fumenaro Konoye has been a leading figure in the small but determined peace faction. When he talks to the emperor, he begins by saying, it is regrettable to say, but our defeat has already become certain. He argues that a defeat would lead to a communist revolution and the destruction of the imperial system. The only way to prevent this is by making peace with the allies. But 
Konoya is the only man to come out clearly against the war. On the whole, the members of the Yushin are either firmly behind the war or at least too afraid or too reluctant to speak out openly against it. The most bullish of all is former Prime Minister Hideki Tojo. He has unshakable faith in the war situation. He also mirrors some of the language that Hitler uses and lashes out at the weakness among the Japanese population, saying, The latest air raid on the homeland is just a mere precursor of strikes that will follow based on modern warfare strategy. If the public gets exhausted by such a trivial event, we can never consider accomplishing anything great in the Greater East Asia War. Hiroito concludes from these meetings that the nation must stick to the current strategy. One last decisive victory before seeking negotiations with the Western allies. And there you have it. A rush of allied diplomacy building up to the Yalta Conference. The fate of millions of people in Eastern Europe and the Balkans basically decided. The question whether the Soviets will join the war against Japan and what to do about a defeated Germany remaining up in the air. And the Axis powers thinking remarkably similar thoughts as the enemy closes in on them. A death spiral fueled by the most blinkered ideologies. In Germany, fear and cowardice leads to diverging paths towards ultra-loyalty or skulking betrayal. In Japan, militarism rules and the people are little more than toy soldiers sacrificed for an impossible goal. And those who dare speak up find their words falling on deaf ears. Meanwhile, the death and destruction, the bombing, the atrocities, and the battles continue to reap as many lives as any time during the war. This is Modern War.